Well, living in Africa really allows you some good opportunities to live by faith. And, um, and it's true. Can I just say that, that it's true? Living by faith is a real thing. You feel no alarm. And, uh, you know, we were driving down the road one day in a taxi, and, uh, which is just basically like a normal car. And um, my two kids were in the back, J- Jacob, or J- Jacob and J- um, Julie. And the taxi driver's going about 45 or 50 miles an hour, and whack, something hits the side of the car. And another car had just gone by really close. And the taxi driver says, that guy just hit my mirror. Which immediately I thought, didn't, maybe you hit his mirror. <laughs> and the cars came so close that they hit mirrors and broke his mirror clean off. And, you know, it's, it's things like that that are common. And uh, the funny thing is we don't live in fear. We just know that God takes care of us. And we believe that. And so I looked to my kids in the back, and they're both like, and I said, Zambian jousting. And to this day, we laugh about that. And, you know, you think, well, you came so close to being in a head-on collision. And that could be fatal in Zambia, because there's no 911, there's no emergency. I I take that back. Our local fire department in Matero, 70,000 people, person town, they uh, just a couple months ago just finally got their first aid training. So isn't that great? And, um, you know, you think about that, you could have been killed. But you, you don't think of it like that way. You think of it in terms of, you know, God protects us. You do what you can do to be safe, and you don't make stupid decisions, and then God takes care of you. And I can tell you that time and time and time again, uh, that's been the case. Let's open our Bibles to the book of Luke in chapter 13. Luke in chapter 13. I'm going to call this Jesus uh, and his rocky relationship with fig trees. Jesus had kind of a rough relationship with fig trees. Look at verse 7 of Luke chapter 13. Then said he to the dresser of the vineyard, Behold, these three years I come asking fruit on this tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till, till I shall dig about it and dung it, put fertilizer on it. And if, it shall be, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And so there's this fig tree. It's not producing. And the, the master comes and says, cut it down. It, it's, why does it cumbereth the ground? Why would you have a tree that doesn't produce anything? Turn back, if you would, to the book of Matthew in chapter number 21. Matthew In chapter 21, this is the other uh, instance or instance of Jesus in a fig tree. And this one's even more puzzling. The first one makes sense to me. If you've got a fig tree, put some fertilizer on it. And if it doesn't produce, cut it down. But but I went out and, uh, well, let me just read this passage and I'll tell you what I did. Okay. And he left them, verse 17 of chapter 21. Chapter 21 of Matthew, verse 17. And he left them and went out in the city into Bethany. And he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. And said unto it, let no fruit go on thee henceforth forever. Now another passage says this, for the time of the figs was not yet. And it's the same parallel passage to this one. For the time of the figs was not yet. In other words, the Bible gives the reason why there were no figs on this fig tree. For the time of the figs was not yet. And then Jesus curses it. And I've heard a lot of people say a lot of things about this. And quite frankly, none of them made sense to me. Let's read on. And presently the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Now, let me tell you something about fig trees. I went out and planted seven fig trees. And I did this in about October. And I bought little grafted fig trees about this tall. And you know they've already got figs on them? The first thing they wanted to do was produce a fig. I've got a fig tree that I'm not kidding you is this tall and it's got a little fig on it. And the fig trees are a unique fruit in that they just want to produce. Okay, that's the characteristic of a fig tree. When you look at the the, the, the view of prosperity in the Old Testament, the phrase used three or four times is, and the fig trees and the pomegranates produced no more. 
And that's when God's cursing the nation and the, the, the dramatic statement from the prophet of God that rings through and would shock everyone is, and the fig tree and the pomegranate produced no more. Now that doesn't mean anything to me, and it probably doesn't mean anything to you, but I've also got seven pomegranates because I wanted to see how they grow. And you know what they did? They're already trying to fruit too. And the, the fruit, the, 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 the pomegranate, just this little, little tree, I put it in the ground, and it starts to grow, and it wants to produce flowers, and it wants to produce pomegranates, and they fall off the tree because the roots aren't deep enough. You cut the cuttings off of those pomegranate trees, you stick them in the ground, and they start a new tree, a clone. I know a South African guy that bought a pomegranate in Europe. One fruit, he took the seeds from it rather than eating them and planted them. Five years later, he has 25,000 pomegranates. Trees. They're more like a bush, but we call them a tree, so we just, that's the way we do it. And the reason is, is because every time you prune those things back, every piece of cutting that you get that's four inches long can be stuck in the ground. It creates a whole new tree, and they grow fast. I saw, if I've got a picture on my phone of a one-year-old pomegranate in Zambia. It's got, I think, 12 or 15 pomegranate fruits hanging on it. And the figs are the same way. They just want to produce. They're, they're just, the, the, if you can't grow anything, move to a subtropical area and plant fig trees and pomegranates. And they just grow. And they're amazing. They don't get diseases. They don't have problems. The pomegranates are almost immune from everything. And they just, they just grow. And so when God says in the Old Testament, and the fig tree and the pomegranate will bear no more, everyone in that era, in that culture knew, boy, this is bad. Because if those don't produce, that's a total disaster. Because of every agricultural crop, those are the easiest ones to grow and the most fruitful. And so when we come into the New Testament, we see Jesus has this relationship with the fig trees. Let's turn back to the book of Luke and let's take a brief overview of what's going on in the passage. The first part of the passage deals with this idea that people could be good and other people are going to be bad. And that's the concept of, of Luke chapter 13, 1 through 5. These people come to Jesus and, and they say, the, these people that, uh, that, the, that Pilate killed and he mingled their blood with the sacrifice, are they sinners above all the rest? And that's what they're asking. They're asking this in essence. Are the people that some tragic event happened to, are they more sinners than the rest of the people? In other words, did these things happen to those people because they committed some sin or were worse? And the answer, of course, is no. I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. Repent of what? Repent of the thinking that these people were bad and you're good. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to, of course, the Pharisees and the scribes and all of these people that are instilling this stuff in the nation of Israel. It comes then to this this fig tree illustration, and this fig tree story is kind of just laid right in the middle of Luke chapter 13, and at first it never made sense, the context, and then as it goes on, we see that Jesus goes in the habit, into the Sabbath, on the Sabbath heals a woman, and it goes on after this, that the Jews stir up trouble, and then it ends with Jesus saying, you know, if only, if only you would have come unto me, and only if you would have received me, I would have received this nation of Israel like a chicken receives these baby chicks under her wing, would have protected them and would have been this wonderful relationship that could have been, but it's not because the nation of Israel rejected Jesus Christ. And that's that chapter. And then you look at that fig tree right in the middle, and you cannot help but to think that the purpose and the point of this illustration of the fig tree is that the nation that should have been productive, that should have produced fruit like a fig tree, is sitting there three years old, not even producing a single fig. Totally barren. And Jesus comes and says, why cumbereth it the ground? I'm going to cut it down, and I'm going to replace it with another fig tree. And is that not what Jesus did when he took the nation of Israel and is that cut them off and said, now I'm going to go over and work with the Gentiles, and we're going to have this period of time where we're dealing with the local church and primarily Gentile people. And that's where we're at right now. Not that he's going to forget this tree, he's going to come back to it one day, but I don't want to get into all of that, but that's what that's talking about. And it's talking about even on a more base level, an even more, more simple level, the idea that God expects productivity. God expects fruitfulness. God expects us to produce fruit. And I want to ask you a question. What was the curse that God pronounced on the fig tree? 
The other passage, remember that one? We just read it. What was the curse? Do you remember? What was it? Do you know what most people say? Jesus cursed the fig tree. This is the way I always thought of it. Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered. Right? That's not what the curse was. Do you know what the curse was? The curse was bear fruit no more. He told the fruit tree, you're not going to bear any more fruit. You're done bearing fruit. And when the fig tree realized it wasn't going to bear fruit anymore, what did it do? It withered away. Right? And I, I think that's a principle in the Christian life. That you, you know, there's a lot of people that have given up bearing fruit, that don't want to bear fruit, and there's many, many churches across the United States. You know what? When you look at Christianity, not just independent Baptist churches, when you look at Christianity, evangelical Christianity, people all, all across, do you know how many people have led a soul to Christ that are Christians? Have personally led a soul to Christ? It's, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 or 3% of all Christians. Is it any wonder that we see churches and Christians struggling and and dying and living a withered Christian life. Is it any wonder? And people get intimidated by it. They say, well, how can I go out? I'm not a theologian. Let me tell you something. You don't need to be a theologian to lead a soul to Christ. It's really simple. Here's how you do it. You walk up to somebody. How are you doing today? Knock on their door. And you say, hey, you know what? I'm just kind of doing an informal survey. Can I ask you a question? And if they say no, you walk away. No problem. If they say yes, sure. They're curious. Most people will say sure. Say, well, do you believe there's a heaven and a hell? In other words, I'm not pushing anything on them. I'm not doing anything without their permission. They give me per I ask permission every step of the way when I lead somebody to Christ. I asked you, can I, I'm doing a survey. Can I ask you some questions? Yes. Do you believe there's a heaven and a hell? Most people will say yes. I found that even in Salem, Oregon, most people would say yes. Do you believe the Bible is God's word? Again, you're going to find that most people, even in the United States of America today, most people will say yes. They have no idea what that means. They have no idea the, the implications and the consequences of saying, I believe that the Bible is God's word. They have no idea. But they inherently believe that. I mean, we're not living in a land where people are just blatantly rejecting God, despite what you see on the news media. The news media shows you the most extreme fringe element to try to normalize it. When you go out, I mean, I was shocked. I went out in Salem, Oregon. I don't know if you know where Salem, Oregon is. It's the capital of Oregon. You know, that conservative bastion of God-fearing people, right? No, that state that's probably the most liberal God-rejecting state in the nation, or one of the top three, you know, Oregon. And... Almost every single person that I spoke to believed there's a heaven and hell, and they believed that there is a, a, a God in heaven, and they believe that the Bible is God's word. So all I've asked them now is what they believe. Then I ask them, who do you believe goes to heaven and hell? Now, when you've asked those three questions, you pretty much have everything you need to go to tell them how to get saved. Because they're going to answer, who do you believe? So I'm going to tell you what they're going to say right now. They're going to say, well, I believe good people go to heaven and bad people go to hell. And that's the number one answer you're going to get. And then all you have to do is say, could I share with you what the Bible says about that? If they say no, no harm, no foul. You haven't offended anybody. If they say yes, you can open up the Bible and show them the verses that say it's not by our good works that salvation is a free gift. And there's some real simple illustrations that you can use that you can take and lead somebody to Christ. If nothing else, you've opened up the conversation and at least interjected some truth so that the next person that comes by is going to, going to be there. Now, let me just tell you this. You ought to be talking to everybody about heavenly things. You ought to just be talking to everybody about it. You ought to be talking to your kids about it. You ought to be talking to your, 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 your neighbors about it. You ought to be talking to people that you know around the town about it. When you go get a soda pop or something, you ought to talk to those people about it. You ought to be handing them tracts. You ought to be doing that stuff. And we can all do that. Now, here's what we, we can't do more than we can do. Everybody's got a limit, right? You know, you, you, I can go out and walk and knock on doors for probably four hours before I get real tired. Need a break. I can go sit down and have a cup of coffee and go and do another four hours. You say, well, I can only talk for maybe uh, 20 minutes. Well, then do it for 20 minutes. 
You know, just do what you can do. Don't worry about trying to hit some standard over here. God doesn't really care how much you do. He just cares that if you do what you can. Amen? And, and maybe all you can do is ask that person a question, give them a track and say, this will tell you how to get to heaven. And it's not by works. It's by, you know, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. It's a free gift of salvation. Here's where it talks about a free gift. Just memorize those two verses. Write them down on a card and show them the card. It's really, you say, is it really that simple? Yes, it is. And you know the problem? A lot of people want to get into the habit of arguing and trying to convince people, but a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And I'll tell you what, the guy that you talk to that wants to argue and wants to debate and wants to reject, you could stand there for two hours. Brother Rocky and I could come and help you for another two hours. He ain't going to change. But the guy that God's working on his heart and the guy that's tender... A child could lead him to Christ because he's ready. You're just looking at planting seeds and you're looking at harvesting fruit. And then maybe you do more planting than harvesting and that's okay. What I'm teaching you is how to bear fruit. Amen? We want to be, we're fig trees. And we don't want to be barren fig trees. Amen? Nobody, who would want to, what Christian would want to be a barren fruit tree? But I, I'll tell you, the devil's got everybody sewn up in fear and sewn up in, in I can't do it and, and, and convinced that they're not worthy and convinced that they don't have all the answers. If you don't have the answer to some question, you know what you say? Well, that's a great question. I don't have an answer for that. Let me come back to you. Then you go learn. And yes, it is really that simple. And I'm going to tell you something else. There's only about five things people say. There's always the nut that, that just is completely extreme, but most people only ask about five questions. And so we see that the fig tree here, what did it need? It needed a little fertilizer. And, and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the vineyardist here is probably like unto the pastor, said, now listen, before you cut this down, put a little fertilizer on it. What's that fertilizer? A little bit of the word of God, a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of uh, you can do it. A little bit of, it's still possible to make a difference. Because you know what? We can't be on the field unless there's churches like this here that are supporting us. We cannot be there. We're, we're, we're sitting in the field on a thread. And that thread is these churches back in the United States. If that thread breaks, there's no way we can make a living in Zambia. They won't let us. We have to bring $250,000 in the country to even start a business. And then we'd be a businessman and we wouldn't be a missionary. And so we're totally dependent upon churches in the United States growing, staying strong, reviving, and having a mission's heart. So one of the ways you can be fruitful is you can go. And you can go right here. And you can go to your kids and you can go to your neighbors and you can go to the people walking in front of the church and you can go to the businesses and you can drop tracks all over this town. Everybody in this town ought to know this church because they're picking up these stupid tracks all the time. Amen? What would be wrong with that? And that's something anybody can do, right? Anybody can do that. And you can, you can bear fruit by praying. You can be praying for these missionaries you've got up on the wall. You can be praying for new missionaries. You can be praying that your giving will increase. You can be praying that you could do more for missionaries. And I'm going to tell you something. Don't get in this idea, the thinking that little is nothing. Don't make that mistake. Because Jesus, when he fed the 5,000, he took the little fish and the little loaves of bread from the little boy and did much with it. Amen. One of the things that we struggle with when we come to Zambia, and I've seen uh, other people when they come, they struggle with the overwhelmingness of everything that could be done. The potential. Every missionary comes, they struggle with this. They almost go through depression. Because they start seeing everybody everywhere wants to learn. Everyone everywhere wants to know the Bible. You can go, you know, I've got an offer right now. I could go preach, and, preach to, like, I think, he, I think the guy said 3,000 soldiers. But I have to drive five hours north to do it because that's where the military base is. I don't have time to drive five hours north. I got a family I got to take care of, and I got a church I got to take care of, and I got a bunch of young men that I'm training and discipling. So you have to just say, no, I can't do that. And you say no to those things all of the time. I could have a ministry in Zambia just driving from prison to prison to prison. Just in Lusaka, I could have a full-time ministry just preaching to people in prison. And let me tell you, a bunch of them would get saved. But if I do that, then I can't be training these young men. And I can't be pastoring this church. And I can't be doing that work. 
So you really have to pray about what not to do. And when a person comes and they see the potential and they see the need and they see the, the, just the need, and it's not a bunch of people that there's a need, okay, and they don't want the need. It's not, it's not a bunch of people that have a sickness and they don't want the medicine. It's a bunch of sick people that want the medicine of the gospel. I can walk out in front of the church and I can stop and I can just stop people as they're walking. It's a big walkway there. We're right on a main causeway for foot traffic. And I can stop people and preach to them all day long. I can go into a market and hand out 4,000 tracts with about five or six guys. And we can put 4,000 tracts out in about two hours. And there's multiple places we can do that. And every time we do that, we see visitors coming to church. We see people calling church. We see people coming in, asking questions. How can we be saved? So there's much fruit to be had. And, and it can be overwhelming. And eventually you have to realize, I can't do all of that. All I can do is this. Right? And so you become at peace with that. And you say, God doesn't expect me to go beyond my human abilities. This is all I can do. And you just have to be content with that. And to a certain extent, that's the same way it is in the United States. The difference is, a lot of times, we in the United States, we lose the burden for those souls because we believe something that's not true. And that thing that's not true is this. Somebody else will go tell them. And I think that's a very dangerous thing to believe, that they're going to find the gospel and find the way to heaven through somebody else. I talked to a man in Burma one time. He was a national pastor. And I asked him, of the men that he had saved in his church, how many of those men went into full-time ministry? He thought for a minute, and he told me, about 85%. And I thought, my word. Why in the world would... Why, why in Burma is it 85% of the men are surrendering to go be preachers, and then you come to the United States and you'll find, you know, you'll find 400 at Heartland or 200 at Heartland, and they're in Bible college and they can't even make it into the ministry. You think, good night, what's wrong? And you know what the difference is? I asked him why, and he said, it's real simple. We're a Buddhist country. There aren't any Christians anywhere. All those men have come to the capital city from all these villages and towns, clear up in the jungle, clear up in the mountains, and they know that if they don't go, nobody in their family is going to learn how to be saved. They'll all die and go to hell. They know it, and they believe it. So they pick up the mantle and they go. And I think a lot of times in the United States we have a tendency to think, well, somebody else will get the job done. Somebody else will go. Somebody else is more qualified than me. Somebody else will put those tracks out. Somebody else will tell my neighbor. And heaven forbid, somebody else will tell my son. And I'm telling you, they're not out there. You got all these churches out here, they're trying to get into this lifestyle evangelism. You know, they're going to see Jesus in my life. Really? I mean, I try to live right, but I'm not that arrogant. I mean, really, do you think? I mean,. They'll probably see me mad at a traffic stop what they'll see. I've got to go tell them and proclaim it. And say, don't look at me. You need to look at him. Amen? And so there's this idea that we need to be concerned about being fruitful. We need to be concerned about telling others. And we need to stop worrying about how it makes us look. We need to start worrying about what it means in their life. Look, people are going to close the door in your face. And I had this one. But, you know, a lot of times those are the best stories. I had this one guy who was down in Salem, knocked on his door. He opened up his sliding window, and he had this ear piercing like this, ear piercing. It looked like, a cow, it looked like you know, those rings they put on a cow, keep the cow from eating. I don't know if this new diet program, but the guy was pretty thin, so if it was, it was working. And, you know, he had ring here, ring here, ring here, ring here. He said, I started my own religion. Well, now... Immediately, I am interested. Because how many times have you met somebody that started their own religion? Have you ever met anybody that started their own religion? I, so I'm, I'm thinking, I should get this guy's autograph. Maybe it's going to be the next big cult. So I said, well, tell me about it. And he says, well, I don't believe in pushing it on other people. Well, you're not pushing. I mean, I'm asking. I really want to know. He told me no again. I said, listen, I sincerely am really interested in knowing about your religion, primarily because I knew I'd tell stories about it and mock it later. But I'm sincerely interested. And he says, well, we have three gods. Well, really? You know their names? Yes. What are their names? He says, this is just really weird. I don't know why you're here asking me all this. He slams the window closed and puts his curtain closed. 
There's just crazy people out there. That's a great story. I'm going to tell that story probably till I die. It's fun. It's entertaining. You can get over the fear, and you can get over the idea that, you know, it's, it's too much, you can't do it. Let me just tell you, it's fun. And you can just walk up to people. Don't worry about what people think. It doesn't matter what they think. It matters what the truth is. Hand them a track. Ask them if they know how to get to, I mean, just remember those questions. Can I ask you a survey? Do you believe, you know, what do you believe? Do you believe there's a heaven and hell? Do you believe there's a Bible? What do you believe? you just asking them what they think, then they tell you. Then when they tell you that, you know the verse to take them to. Can I just show you what the Bible says about that? Open up the Bible and let them read it. And if they say, no, I don't want to hear what the Bible says, find somebody else. No skin off your back, right? You, can you do that? Amen. And I think you should do that. And I think it'll, it'll change your life. And you know what it'll do? When I, when, I, when I start to get under stress, and I'm struggling to get to town, and the cars, oh my word, I got, you know what they do? They will take, you'll be going down a, ride, a road, okay? Now I'm supposed to drive this way, and over here they drive this way. It's backwards, okay? I got that. But they don't know it's backwards. That's normal for them. So when this lane gets all jammed up, and we're not going forward. Do you know what they'll do? They'll start driving into the oncoming traffic lane. Like that's a viable solution. And I've seen a two-lane road with four lanes going one way, and there's no way any other car can come back. And it'll be hours. I saw one guy, oh my word, this semi-truck comes out onto the road, crosses my lane, and goes to turn like this. This is the traffic lane going you know, he's going this way, and I'm going this way. Well, I can't go this way because his trailer is blocking the road. Well, he can't go this way because 70 people lost their mind temporarily and drove into the oncoming traffic lane thinking they're going to get there sooner. And they blocked it so the truck's like this, they're like this, everybody's like this, nobody's going anywhere. And then they all decide to honk like that's a viable solution. So, man, I said, I saw that ahead, and I said, I pulled an emergency over the curb around, got down this road, spent 45 minutes going around. 45 minutes later, I got to the other side of the semi-truck, and you know what I saw? Nothing's changed. Everybody's still honking. Honk, honk, honk. And I just said, Lord, thank you for delivering me from this. And I'll tell you what, that's funny the first three times it happens. It's hilarious. It's a great prayer letter. But the 27th time you see this happened, a man can get a little carnal. I got out one time, and I started directing traffic trying to unclog it because the go-around would have taken an hour and a half. And I'm there, and pretty soon this guy walks up and says, Are you with the government? And I said, no, I'm not with the government. What are you doing? I'm trying to get home. The only way is to stand in the intersection and try to direct this traffic. He's like, well, I got a truck trying to come through here, and it's got to get over here at a certain time. I said, you better help me then, because your truck ain't going to make it. So he's helping me. Pretty soon the military shows up. They get out. What are you guys doing? We're directing traffic. He's like, yeah, this is a mess, isn't it? Yeah. We got an ambulance coming. I said, well, your ambulance isn't going to make it through unless you guys help. So pretty soon we got a good group of people there. And we're starting to direct traffic. And this guy, he's got his little Toyota Corolla or some little Celica. And he's, I'm standing, I say, no, wait. And so he gets doing the, I'm going to charge you with the Celica. Well, I just put my boot on the top of his car and said, hey, what do you think you're doing? And that soldier walked over and says, what's going on? I said, this guy won't wait. He said, do you want me to pull you out of that car and take you to jail? The guy's like, no. Then listen. I felt good. That made me happy. No, but you know, here's the point. You go home and you deal with that type of stuff, just total insanity. And you know what? You say, you're just, you're almost crazy. It makes you so upset. You know what fixes that? Slowing down, walking down the street, taking a gospel track, saying, hey, let me ask you a few questions about the Lord. And the worst day is miraculously transformed into a wonderful victory. Isn't that amazing? I don't know how you'd live without that tool. God designed us to bear fruit. He designed us like the fig tree. And the fig tree just wants to bear fruit. 
Now, let's go back to that first one where it said they're withered. And the time of the figs was not yet. You know what that's talking about? Most fig varieties, a good portion of them, there's about 250 varieties of figs. They set what's called a Berber crop. It's B-E-R-B-E-R, Berber. I think is how you spell it. And that's a, a first fruit crop. And it's a small crop. In fact, you could grow figs in Kansas. You won't get the main crop ever because your growing season is just not long enough. But you'll get the Berber crop. And a lot of guys even in New York will grow fig trees. And they'll literally dig those fig trees up, put the roots in balls, let them go dormant, put them in a garage, and then take them back out and plant them. Other places in Minnesota, they'll let them just, they'll let them just die down to the ground. And then the fig will shoot up, and the first thing it does is set a few figs. All, often even before it lays, puts a, a, a leaf out. And there's that first crop that happens you know, before that main crop. Now, Jesus came to that fig tree in the spring. And, and I've read different commentaries, and they said this is about the time, about March is when he came to this fig tree. And that's the time when that Berber crop is being set and, and, and producing. And so he came to, a, came to this fig tree. The time of the main harvest wasn't yet, but there should have been figs on that tree, just a few as a Berber crop. There's that first fruits. And the fig tree didn't produce those first fruits. And so Jesus cursed it. He says, if you won't bear fruit, then you'll never bear fruit. Let me say that again. If you won't bear fruit, then you'll never bear fruit. And you remember way back when, when you got saved, and there was just a joy in your heart that your sins were forgiven and you knew you were going to heaven. You remember those days. And for some of us, that was a long long time ago. And you know what renews that joy? It's when you bear fruit, when you take the gospel and you give it to somebody else. And I, I was in a missions conference and it was, the, it, was the, it was one of the best missions conferences I was ever in. And there was a bunch of teenagers that the people in the church would just bring these teenagers into church. They brought them for the missions conference and they heard the preaching of God's word. And after the preaching on Thursday night, three of those teenagers came down and they got saved. They started coming down to the altar. A whole bunch of them came down. And I mean, it was like God was moving. And this young lady, well, she's not young. She's probably 30, young now for me. And she went over there and she led this lady to Christ. And the preacher got up and he's so excited. He said, boy, wasn't this a great missions conference? Wasn't this a great night? Boy, these teens stand up. You got saved. And all those teenagers, they're happy. They got smiles. Boy, they're excited. And Miss So-and-So up here in the front, it's the first time she's ever led somebody to Christ. And boy, you could see the same joy on that lady, on this young lady. She's just, she's just beaming. It's like she got saved. Now she didn't. She just helped get somebody else saved. When you don't have that fruit bearing, when that fruit is not born, that's the curse that Jesus put on somebody. And I, it, it is just... Maybe I'm different. I don't know. When I got saved, I wanted to stand on top of a roof and scream it out. I wanted to just stand on the roof and scream to the whole town. Don't you want Jesus? I knew I'd look like a nut. And I'll admit that you don't want to look like a nut because you, know, you look crazy. Then it repels people, right? So you got to use the right bait. So over the years, I've tried to figure out how can I approach people in a non-threatening direct, blunt way, and, and, and you can do it, okay? You can do it. You just got to stop. I'll tell you one thing I did. This was kind of funny. I decided to just approach some guy in the bank the way that I talked to people in Zambia. Now, this was fun because he wasn't interested at all, and I could tell he wasn't interested, but he brought it up. I walked to the bank, and I asked him how he's doing today, and he said, well, pretty good, but this weather's terrible. God knows we haven't seen the sun in three weeks. Oh, do you know God? I mean, you, he brought it up, right? He says, well, that's just, a, that's just a, 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 a saying. I said, well, it may be a saying, but there is a real God, and he does know the weather. Well, I, I don't believe any of that. Well, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. It's true. And boy, I just went right down the bean row and preached salvation. And you know what? That wasn't that, I mean, it was stressful for him. It was stressful for the other employees of the bank. I'm sure they were probably calling the police any time now. It was stressful for the other customers. It was even stressful for me. But 
It was interesting. I had a good time. It's a good story now. You don't have to do it like that. You can do it gentle. But don't you, don't, isn't it interesting, though, that, that, you know, when we get saved, there's usually something in us that wants to tell other people. But if we don't, do you know what happens? We wither. And we take on ourselves the curse that Jesus put on the fig tree. But we take it not because Jesus puts it on us. We take it voluntarily. I'm going to be unfruitful. I'm just going to sit back and be unfruitful. Do you know that's a curse? Why would anyone want to take a curse on them? And you know, that's, that's really a characteristic of this lost world. And you remember the original curse in the Garden of Eden? What was the original curse? There was two. There was a curse for the man. There's three. Curse for the man, a curse for the woman, and a curse for the serpent. We'll forget the serpent, because hopefully he's not here today. But the man and the woman, what was the curse of the man? He's going to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. He's going to have to work. So what's all the women want to do? They want to go work. Right? And now what do you see? You see all these insane men wanting to have babies and be pregnant. The men want the women's curse. The women want the men's curse. We ought to just say, you know, I don't want any curses. Right? So what we need to do is this. We need to say, you know what? As best as I can... I want to be fruitful. I want to just, with what I have, with what's left of my life, the years that I have, and I don't, I don't know if I have two years or 20 years. I have no idea. But, but shouldn't we all just say, you know, I want to try to bear some fruit with what little I can. And I can bear it by telling people. I can bear it by giving. And I can bear it by praying. And I can bear it by going. Amen? Let's all stand. Brother Rocky.